product not yet rated. Hi guys, uh, my name is Ragnar Tornquist. I'm the uh, senior producer and creative director of The Secret World. Today we're going to be showing off a bunch of new stuff, including the uh, Dragon new player experience, some cool new features, including achievements and lore. We're going to start with character creation. And as we see right here, we have the first screening character creation, where you select your faction. Uh, previously, we've seen uh, footage from Illuminati uh, startup experience in New York City. We've seen the Templars in London. But today the focus is on the dragon, uh, and we're going to create a uh, dragon character right now. And take a little bit of a look at our character creation. Um, contains what you expect the character creation to contain. So let's cycle through some of the heads here. These are the base heads. These are heads you can use as a starting point for creating your own head. Um, we'll have a lot more variety at launch, of course. You can also vary the skin color, so let's go with uh, this one. Looks pretty nice. Uh, then we can change the eyes in order to modify the face a bit. Change the eye color as well, maybe go with green. Green is always good. Change the noses. Again, we're going to have a bigger selection of this at launch. Uh, I think we'll go with the first one there. Looks good. Um, the lips we can change. And then finally the jawline uh, we can modify. Right there, that looks good. Okay, let's jump over to the uh, hair style section. So here we have a bunch of different hairstyles available for your character. Uh, anything from punk to not punk and girl next door. Let's go with something boyish. That looks sexy. So let's choose that. Facial hair color. We can do the eyebrows. Get those red as well. And then finally, makeup. There will be a lot of different makeup available. We have one extreme example here. Let's uh, just go all natural and look uh, plain and simple instead. <laughs> All right, so for the clothing, we'll have a good selection of clothing available in character creation, but most of the clothes players will earn in the game through uh, completing dungeons, decks, rewards of various kinds. And they can also buy clothes in uh, a clothing store in London using in-game currency. So we have a variety of items here, but let's go with just this top. For the legs, we uh, have some uh, camo pants and some hot pants as well. But I think we'll go with the uh, jeans. They look good. And then finally, the shoes. Some boots and sneakers, but I think the uh, red sneakers look best. Let's use those. And then finally, we can uh, do some character size adjustments. I think we'll stick with the, uh, the middle on that one. All right, finally, you'll be able to create your name. Uh, since this is a game set in the... Uh, <laughs> In the real world, you'll be able to have a first name and a last name and a nickname. And in this case, we've appropriately chosen Dolly as the nickname. All right, let's jump into Seoul. And uh, I'll let Joel Bylas, who's the lead content designer, talk a little bit about uh, the Dragon startup experience. All right, today we're going to be walking you through the new player experience in Seoul. As with everything to do with the Dragon, this is all about chaos. And so now the player has to kind of find their way and see what, see what they can find or who they can find to lead them further on into the city. And almost immediately we encounter this strange child in a raincoat. Um, and you can hear that there's some strange noises. And uh, with, the, with the hub cities, each, each uh, players will be able to experience social interaction in the hubs. These are all about being the social areas of the game. So in uh, in these places you have the auction house, you have the bank, you have fight clubs, you have dance clubs, you have theatres, you have all of these activities for players to take, take part in, as well as each faction having their own headquarters in the hub. Um, and yeah, we really tried to recreate the feel of these locations in the world. So you have, you know, London feels like London, New York feels like Brooklyn, and uh, Seoul feels like Seoul. And if you've ever been there, I'm sure you'll agree. So, as you can see ahead, we have a boutique hotel, which is one of the very important locations in Seoul. Uh, and this all ties into the sort of story mission. As the players play, they'll be repeatedly, repeatedly coming back to these locations to find out more information about what's happening in the secret world. And uh, as you enter this place, you'll see on the right, there's a karaoke bar. The karaoke bar is, again, a place where players actually pick up the missions through hearing songs sung by the karaoke singers, which is pretty cool. 
So we're going to follow the child, the weird child, up the staircase and uh, see where the child is leading us into the heart of chaos. You're shy. Shy, confused, lost. Hmm. You're not lost anymore. The dragon found you. And now, you found me. Everything happens for a reason. Every event, no matter how small, has consequences. They will ask you to do things, and most of the time, you will not know why, or what the consequences may be. It is the curse of the dragon. We do not know why we do what we do, but we do it regardless, because they tell us it is right. From chaos, there is order, order, and clarity. The one moment of absolute clarity comes in that brief exhalation of ecstasy. When our minds are empty, we are receptive to the truth. Most of the time, you will not understand their reasons. You will not be able to see the consequences of your actions. But there is one event you must understand. One truth. It's my job to help you see it. Every faction comes to this location, the Tokyo Flashback, and all of them come through very different mechanics, which have all been revealed now. The Templars arrive here by the mechanic of uh, listening to a madman prophesying on the streets of London. The Illuminati arrive here by being pinned down by a crazy doctor and injected with strange experimental serums. And the Dragon arrive here, as you just saw, in a much more natural and organic way. So each faction arrives in this location in their own way but everybody shares the same instigating event in the story and understands it together. So one of the most important parts about this is the filth, which is this black substance that you see scattered all over the place. We're going to be coming back to the filth during this presentation and talking more about how important a role it plays in the story of The Secret World. Hi guys, my name is uh, Martin Bruscard. I'm the lead designer of the game. Uh, and now we're going to take a quick look at uh, the basic combat mechanics. So as the player is playing the game, uh, he's getting XP from many different sources. Uh, doing tasks for your secret society, doing missions, killing monsters, crafting, and PvP. Um, and the XP bar is located here at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and as you can see, it's divided up in three segments. When the player fill fills up uh, the first third, or one third of these, he will be getting uh, an ability point. And it looks like this. Uh, if he fills up the whole bar, he will be getting a skill point, which looks like that. Uh, and the player can spend these points in the ability wheel. So this is the ability wheel. It holds over 500 unique abilities, and the player can own every single one of them on a single character. 
We have lots of cool different abilities spread out over nine different weapon types. We have shotguns, pistols, assault rifles, blades, hammers, fist weapons, blood magic, chaos magic, and elementalism. Now, there are two types of abilities. The active abilities that you actively press to make something happen, for instance, a sword attack or a sniper shot. Uh, equally important are the passive ones. The passive abilities affect your character all the time and they can really alter the way that the active abilities work. Now, of course, you can run around with 500 abilities, so we're asking the players to make a choice. You have to pick out seven active abilities and seven passive abilities, and that is referred to as a build. Now, every single square here um, is called a cell, and they hold seven abilities. And the, the player has to buy these sequentially, starting <coughs> from the top uh, with the more basic ones, and then going all the way down to the seventh ability in the cell. The seventh ability in every cell is, is an elite ability. They're super cool and very special and awesome. And the player can only equip one uh, elite active and one elite passive. Now, there's tons of synergy in this system. There's synergy between weapons and synergy between abilities. So a lot of the player's skill comes from uh, combining the right weapons and the right abilities that has some sort of synergy in order to optimize their, their performance. We're going to close this uh, window now and take a look at how combat flows. So here uh, we have a character uh, wielding an uh, assault rifle and a shotgun. Every weapon uh, in the secret world has a resource and you build resources either on yourself or you build resources on the target. Now both a uh, shotgun and assault rifle builds resources on the target and you can see these tiny pips above uh, the monster's head. You, you put those resources on there through um, abilities referred to as bu builders. But you can consume those resources uh, with consuming abilities for uh, extra damage or some cool effects like healing or crowd control, lots of different cool things. So you build resources and you consume resources. Now, every weapon brings something unique to the fight. You can play as a damage dealer with, uh, with any weapon, but they also have a secondary role. Uh, for instance, assault rifle has leeching abilities. A leech ability uh, lets the player get back in health a percentage of their damage output. It's really nice for, for dealing damage and a little bit of healing as well. Uh, shotgun is really good for fighting multiple enemies at the same time because it damages everything in front of them. It doesn't, a lot of the abilities doesn't even require a target. He's also joined here with, uh, uh, by a guy uh, wielding blood magic. And blood magic is really good for applying damage over time, dots, uh, but also these protective barriers that will absorb damage. You'll also notice that the player can move and fight at the same time. And moving and fighting at the same time is really important in the secret world because there are a lot of bad things that you can avoid by, by moving, reading the monster's uh, animations and, and uh, caring about your surrounding, basically. Um, so as these guys are approaching this huge temple, a big boss appears. And this is a nice opportunity to showcase one of the important features of the secret world. We don't have any classes. You're never locked down to a play style. And right now, the character is playing a ranged damage dealer, but we need somebody who can tank this guy. So we need abilities that lets you hold aggro and also soak up a lot of damage. Uh, so we can do that through the gear manager. Here in the gear manager, uh, we've already pre-made uh, a build uh, with hammer and sword abilities. And we can click the little eye here to see what weapon it holds, the gear and the abilities. So with a click of a button, we can go from being a ranged damage dealer to a melee tank-like character, just like that. And this is a really, really important part of the secret world, not being locked down, adapting to your surroundings. All right, so as I mentioned earlier, filth is a very important part of our story. And as players have been exploring Solomon Island and the Blue Mountain, they've stumbled across signs of the filth. In this case, they're coming upon an abandoned CDC encampment. And uh, the CDC were here looking into the filth before the disaster occurred on Solomon Island. So the players need to use this opportunity to find out more. And what better way to find out than by talking to Mariana Chen, the sole survivor of the CDC, a group that was sent out here. So we're going to jump into a conversation with Mariana Chen, who will tell us a little more about the filth. Hey, 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 halt! 
No closer. I'm getting some weird... some weird readings. You might be infected. Everyone here might be infected. I'm with the CDC. I represent the government. So you have to listen to me. We have... I have... This is a quarantined area, and I have authority here. That's why I'm wearing the suit. That's, that's what the suit means. It means the fecal matter has hit the fan, and we're staring phase seven dead in the eye. Frankly, if it didn't violate protocol, I could really use a hug. I feel very vulnerable, especially after the others were exposed. Uh, terminally. They expired. D died. They, they, they died. Horribly. Cursing, screaming, gasping, vomiting, clawing their own eyes out. It was... icky. And then, when it's finally over and they're all dead, you think, Hey, that sucked, but it's done. They're gone. We can deal with that. But oh no. Rising from the dead, shambling ghouls, glowing eyes, tentacles, black slime. Not even your standard government-grade Category Z reanimated corpses. This is brand new terrifying. Run for the hills terrifying. Despite all that training, you, you just want to skedaddle. It started down in that bog, just before the fog came. We'd been shipped in to support the Arachi group, not the other way around. I thought with a Democrat in office, we were past these kinds of dodgy arrangements. But I guess absolute power corrupts regardless. And absolutely. Just like this Category A agent, the filth, it corrupts absolutely. Body and soul. Yeah, the filth. That's what they call it, for real. How the hell do you work with a name like that, The Filth? You're just asking for it. So if I were you, I'd keep my distance. Safety first. Alright, so... In the secret world, characters are not just begging you for help every time you run across somebody in the world. Sometimes they'll tell you a story and they'll tell you to stay away from something. But players have their own agenda, their own initiative on behalf of their factions. And they have to pursue that. So, in this case, we're going to hack into the CDC laptop and I'm going to show you basically what we call the ghost interface which is our players get this program early in the game on their cell phone and they're able to use it to hack into almost any computer that they come across in the game. So we're going to, you can see that it comes up as like a Linux style terminal interface. You can jump into the field team for example and there you have an, a list of information about the field team and their operations on Solomon Island and uh, Ghost has actually downloaded a HTML version of this so when we close the computer interface if we open our mission journal, the information has been saved in our journal under the show image button here. So when you click that, you get to see the website, the HTML website that uh, Ghost has downloaded. All right, so we're going to move on from here. And we're going to head into the bog to look into the filth a little more because this is where she said that it started. And on our way, we're going to keep an eye out for members of the CDC group who may have been resurrected as filth entities. All right, so in this location, there's plenty of hazards that the player needs to look out for. First and foremost, you have these shade debases, these creatures that live in the waters of the bog. They will pull you into the water, but the water itself is a hazard because the water has been infected with the filth as well. So it will start stacking on the player, doing additional damage and dotting the player for a lot of their health. So it's, uh, it's very important to stay out of the water and stay mobile while you fight these guys. So as you can see, we have humans that have also been infected and these guys are actually wielding weapons. So they haven't forgotten how to use shotguns and, and pistols and things like that and they'll be attacking the player as, as the player goes in. So it's very important that you know, we take these guys down and uh, try to find out what's going on. But we just received our first achievement in the game. And so we're going to open the achievements window now and talk a little bit about the achievement system. Um, so you see the player has got a bunch of achievements. They've received the Got Filth achievement for killing 10 filthy humans. Achievements in, in the secret world can be used to give out rewards. You will get clothing from doing achievements. You will get items. You will get uh, experience, you will get money. All, of, all the achievements in the game give the player awards for completing them. And we have tons of uh, categories for our achievements. Exploration, missions, PvP, regional, dungeons, faction, law, crafting and global achievements. So there's plenty of stuff for players to di sink their teeth into as they play the game. And the really cool part about the achievements is that they all tie into the story in some way. And if you really listen to what players are saying, sorry, what characters are saying as you play the game, you'll learn how 
to do some of these achievements. There's clues in the dialogue, and there's uh, different things you can find out. Alright, so we're going to move forward, killing these guys, make our way through the swamp, and look for the CDC members as we go. Alright, when these guys die, they explode and leave an area of filth around them which can infect the player as well. So you have to be really careful and make sure you stay away from the corpses. Now this is Mavis Anderson. She's one of the uh, CDC members who has been infected by the filth and come back to life. And so now the player needs to take her down <coughs> and hopefully find out what she was looking into with the filth before she was infected. So hopefully her research is somewhere nearby. Alright, so we, oh, we're going to move on and uh, click on this filth postule, which gives us a lore piece. Now, lore in the secret world is a very interesting mechanic because as we talked about earlier, the whole story is a jigsaw puzzle and everything ties into the jigsaw puzzle. And the lore is no exception. The lore is the, is, is the glue that fills in the gaps between the pieces of the puzzle. So, unlike a lot of games, where lore is used as a, almost a, uh, an encyclopedia, so players can look up different topics and you know, it reads like a dry encyclopedia. Our lore is a narrative being told to the player by a mysterious narrator and you don't really know who that is. But as you pick up more and more of the lore, you want to find out more of the story of each of these things. And so it's a, it's a really good way of tying the mechanics together in the game. So we're going to be showing uh one of the locations we have yet to show anything of, this is Transylvania. And we are right in the middle of uh, the beginning area in Transylvania, a burned down Soviet era village, currently under siege by the uh, Vampire Crusade. And the Vampire Crusade, as you may know, is a bunch of vampires who are out to uh, conquer Europe with their vampiric ways. And they have congregated here at the, uh, the foot of the Carpathian Mountains and they basically set fire to stuff. Uh, you'll be fighting vampires uh, in Transylvania, obviously. You'll be fighting a lot of different types of vampires uh, from your bog standard vampires, the ones we're going to encounter here, who are basically normal vampires who just dress really well to protect themselves against the sunlight, to things called blood vampires and eventually uh, mutated vampires, the result of genetic experiments performed by an organization called the Red Hand under the guidance of Stalin in the 60s uh, uh, in, here in Romania. But for now, uh, I'm going to leave it uh, to Martin to talk a little bit more about uh, crafting. Due to the nature of our ability system, uh, where the players can create thousands and thousands of different combinations of abilities, we really wanted to create a crafting system that can support the players in getting the right items for the right build. If you're focusing on a healing build, you want healing stats on your, on your gear. If you're focusing on uh, getting critical strikes, then, then you want crit rating on your, on your gear. So, our crafting system is called transcribing. And it's basically breaking down items that you find in the, in the game, learning from it, and reassembling it uh, in the item type and the item stats that you want. So right now, we're following a character wielding a hammer. And he just looted a hammer. And it's a pretty basic hammer. And we're going to follow the process of increasing the quality level of this hammer, but also adding uh, crit rating and penetration rating to the item because it's, it's currently uh, using a build that requires or that's it's sort of like a crit penetration build good stuff happens when he crits or gets penetrating hits so this is a basic hammer so we're going to start by by breaking it down and as we do you can see the materials here and the materials they form the shape of a hammer and this is how our our um, transcribing works um, the the shape uh, that these materials form actually defines the item type. So you see it's a hammer, and when we're going to reassemble it later, we need to put it back in the shape of a hammer. So now we've gotten some sacred metal from this. Uh, but as I said, we wanted to upgrade the quality level of this item. So we're going to take the sacred metal, put it back in the box, 
and assemble it, and out we get pure metal. Pure metal is a better form of metal. Uh, we're going to put this in our inventory, and fortunately enough, we've looted some pure metal from before. So we're going to put all these pure metals back in the shape of a hammer. We're also going to add a weapon assembly kit. This will increase the quality level of the hammer. And as we hit assemble, we actually get a blue, a rare hammer with increased weapon power. So now we have a really good hammer, but we still don't have the critical rating or the penetration rating. All our items consist of a prefix, a core, and often a suffix. And the players can create these items themselves and combine them. So right now, we want to create a prefix that adds critical rating and penetration rating. So we're adding the materials that adds uh, crit rating, and we're adding the material uh, that gives penetration rating. We're putting it in the shape of a prefix, and we're adding the prefix assembly kit. And as we hit assemble, we get a glyph of ferocity. This is a prefix. Uh, we put this in our inventory, and we combine it with the hammer that we made previously, and out comes a fierce hammer. And as you can see, it has critical rating and it has penetration rating. So as you can see, this is a really nice supporting tool for the players as they play through the game. Uh, we're just going to equip this hammer now uh, and engage one of the monsters up here on the rooftop. We really think that, that the, the, the crafting system will be a very important part of the economy in the secret world. Um, in an MMO, it's really important to have a healthy economy. And as, since players can craft complete items, but they can also create parts of an item and sell these and trade these, we really think that this will be an important part of the, of the economy and the social interaction of the game. But from here, we're going to leave the rooftops of Transylvania and head over to one of our dungeons. And our dungeon designer, Stephen Lumpkin. Hi, guys. I'm Steven Lumpkin. I'm one of the dungeon designers for The Secret World in Montreal, and I'm here to show you a little bit about The Darkness War, one of our five-man dungeons. Now, um, previously in The Secret World, we've talked a little bit about how you'll be doing some time traveling, but we've never been clear on how that works. Well, we're ready to talk about it now. In The Darkness War, you've met a man in, uh, in New England, a Wabanaki man named Old Joseph, and he uh, has sent the player into a trance that has allowed them to view a vision of New England's history thousands of years ago. And I could tell you all about what happens in the Darkness War, but maybe I'll let old Joseph give you a little blurb himself. The Norsemen came then upon our shores in long boats, and they brought with them a powerful sword. Together, the Wabanaki and the Vikings were to build a shield around this island that would keep it safe from our enemies from those who wish to dig into the mountain and unleash the serpent. So the summary of the story of Darkness War is that the Mayans have invaded, but the Vikings and the Wabanaki are resisting them uh, together, joining forces to push back the Mayan invasion. The Mayans are seeking a place of power where they can perform a dark ritual. Now currently I'm situated pretty early in the dungeon, but we're gonna take you towards the very end of the dungeon to the last boss fight to show you this encounter. So from my vantage point, I can look down and see a group of, of um, Mayan warriors all standing around preparing to uh, engage in a ritual. Now, uh, obviously we want to put a stop to that so we're going to head on down there and get that started. Now as we're killing these Mayans, you can see their spirits fly out of their bodies and down into the pit. This is a mechanic players will have actually seen before in this dungeon. And the previous time they saw it, they saw a powerful creature gaining even more power every time it gained a soul. So there's a little bit of foreshadowing of what might be going on here. As the 
fight goes on, players have to handle more and more Mayans until they're handling the largest group yet. But a good group who've actually seen these creatures in the dungeon before shouldn't have too much trouble taking them out. Now that we've slain all of the Mayans, a nameless beast from beyond the edge of the pit comes and rejoins the fight. The beast is called Wyabzul, the Hound of the Nameless Days. Now for this part of the fight, the dungeon team really wanted to give the feeling that the players were facing a threat that was beyond them, something very damaging and powerful, something they couldn't quite control. And so this creature has a number of abilities to serve this, this purpose. It has this massive spray of filth that leaves behind a dangerous area on the ground. It can also rear up on its hind legs and slam down like this, blurring everyone's vision, after which it chooses a new target. This is a very dangerous behavior that the entire team needs to be careful about. It also has the power to pull uncareful people close to it and then summon powerful magics, creating a blast around itself, damaging everybody nearby. That's something the entire team needs to be sure to avoid. So now that we've dealt a significant portion of damage to him, Wyab Zul has decided that he needs a little reinforcement. So he runs to the edge of the pit, and he disappears, leaving us to deal with the resurrected Mayan force. Now whereas before, we had only a few Mayans at a time to deal with, now we have a large number resurrecting all at once. And this is a much bigger threat to the entire group. But fortunately for us, we're about to get a little help of our own. This is the Varangian, the leader of the Vikings, and he's bearing the powerful sword that old Joseph spoke about early in the dungeon. This sword is Excalibur, and he's using it to channel a powerful magic that affects all of us, tripling our damage output and doubling the amount of damage we can take. Suddenly, these poles of Mayans that were threatening us before are now easy as pie, and we can blast through them without any trouble. This is a great time when we can show players that they are super powerful and really give them the feeling of being superheroes. But of course, we can't just end the fight on an easy note. It's fun to feel powerful for a little bit, but all good things must come to an end eventually. And so, the Hound of the Nameless Days returns from its vacation beyond the pit and with it, a malevolent force from beyond this dimensional rift begins focusing down on the Varangian and slowly damaging him over time. And if we don't finish this fight quickly enough, then the Varangian himself will die. Without his powerful magic healing us and keeping us alive, I don't think we'll be able to finish the fight in time. And as you can see, this fight has actually been escalating over the entire encounter until at the very end we were fighting both the Hound and the Mayans all under the time pressure afforded by the Varangian's health. At the end of the fight, players will be able to speak with the Varangian, learn a little bit more about what he's doing here, and have him awaken them from the trance at the end of the dungeon. But we're not gonna show you that just yet. Instead, we're gonna look here at the edge of this pit this is a scene we've actually seen before, and it serves to sort of tie a number of elements in the game together. And that is the Darkness War.